My guest is Sinead O'Connor. Sinead, welcome. Thank you very much you. for being here today. And um, I'd like at first to talk about your spiritual journey. Uh, um, well, I grew up in um, Ireland, which is obviously a very Catholic country, um, which was in fact a theocracy actually at the time mm. that I was growing up. And it did have very, very strict rules and regulations, and there was something joyless about it. Um, but I was lucky insofar as I only actually sucked up the good things about it. I wasn't affected negatively by the negative. The way I was affected by that was to actually feel sorry for the priests and things like that, that they were getting no joy from their religion. How old were you when you started to sense that? Uh, sort of around the age of seven or so is when really? I began to. Like I'd always been a bit religious because you're born, in, the way it was in Ireland in those days was um, every house you went into there was pictures of the Virgin Mary or Jesus or whatever, God was everywhere, the whole country was like a church, you know. Huh. So it's in your DNA as an Irish person yes. if you were born at the time that I was or previous, you know, say 1990. Yes. It's a very different country now, if you like. So, yes. so it was always kind of there. But I began to maybe observe things. Um, you know, when I was probably sevenish, when you start making your holy communion, you know. And my father used to bring us to mass, and in those days, um, the mass was in Latin or as well as English, you know. So there was a lot of um, singing in it, you know, which I obviously soaked up. But um, there was two things running concurrent that got me, and one was it connected with the rules and regulations. The spirit thing was. Um, as it, seeing things from a child's eyes, I could see that the, God, the priests had no joy in, mm. in God. There was no joy in what they were right. doing. And in fact, right. we, they were teaching people to deny anything which might give them joy. Right. You know? And the fact is that to, to be a good Catholic, you had to think you were a bad person. It was a sin to even think a good thing about yourself. You know? So that, in that mm. way, I felt sorry for them also that they had no wives, no children, you know, no joy, basically. Their whole lives were revolving around a strange set of rules and regulations um, and sort of dictating rules and regulations but at the same time they taught that the Holy Spirit is a bird mm -hmm. you know and from mm -hmm. a childish point of view I really related to that um, so that it was kind of strange I had the sense that you know they would open the tabernacle and take out the host in the chalice and they would say this also is the Holy Spirit and then they would give it out to everybody and then they would uh, put it back in the cupboard as I saw it, you know, uh -huh, so it was uh -huh. as if they, were, they had this bird, but it was imprisoned by all these relations, you know. And you're a child, yeah. you're watching this as a child, because most times with children who, who sense that, and you're right, it really is, you're sensing it rather than understanding it, yeah. but most children will sense they don't fit. You're watching it sensing this isn't right, and that's a very different kind yeah, of approach. Yeah, something is wrong. I suppose you're watching it from the point of view that you like the principles of the thing, like yes. I, I'm, a, I'm a Catholic person in my DNA, all my family, all my ancestors, you know, and I wouldn't have any spirit not for Catholicism. Yes. So it's that you like the thing, but you feel sorry perhaps that it's not serving itself or other people well, and you see the negative effect, like I'm very lucky in that I didn't have the ability to take on the negative effects of Catholicism, but I witnessed the massive unhappiness that people had who did take on the negative aspects, yes. like, you know, having no joy in life, yes. or, or even no joy in their spirituality, like, yes. you know. From a child's point of mm -hmm, view, mm -hmm. you're identifying more with the bird than you are with the older, you know, grown-ups. Are you angry that the bird's in the cupboard? Are you saddened that the bird's in the cupboard? Uh, well, you get the feeling you can't breathe. Do you know that kind of feeling that, you know, uh, because that bird actually symbolizes part of all of us, if right. you say that we, we're, we belong to or are part of that, do you know right. what I mean? So I suppose it's, a, and it's all symbolism, especially if you're seeing things from a child's point of view. So it's that feeling of being unable to breathe, which is unable to live, right. you know, to appreciate life. Do you right. know what I mean? And were you able so, to talk about that to anybody? Could you express that to anyone as a child? I had it read with what I would call the Holy Spirit, and I dealt yes. with it with that. But in Ireland, those days, no, you wouldn't express a different yes. opinion. You had to yeah. toe the party line, like, and yeah, for think. all sorts of reasons, you know, and not just because of the way the church was, but the way children were viewed, do you right. know? And again, being a girl, it was a whole other kettle of fish on top of that like so you'd be afraid like I used to know kids who saw ghosts and this that and the other and of course they did see them but you know they'd tell their parents and the parents give them a slap across the head and say y you didn't see them do you know what oh, I mean really? so you learn actually and that's the thing they the church really told you exactly what to think and exactly what to believe and, and to this exactly day what to express yeah and what to this to day in, it still actually does the same thing mm -hmm. you know I remember I, I went to try to go get into a theology college which I did get into for a while but I had to go to see the boss guy the priest you know mm -hmm. And he said to me, he was asking me questions to see where my head was at about it all. And at one point I was stupid enough to mention that I see, I think that if they say that 
God, that we're made in God's image, then perhaps God isn't perfect, mm -hmm. so that we shouldn't be disappointed and blame God because mm -hmm. we expect God to be perfect. Mm -hmm. blah, blah. Mm -hmm. The blood drained from the guy's body, literally. And it's like, no, God is perfect, and this is what you must think, and this is, we are imperfect, and we aim to be perfect. And oh. So you couldn't challenge, or even for their own benefit. It's not a discussion. What it's, a, you know. it's, it's, it's one way communication. Yeah. And so, yeah. so how so do you bring that to your kids? Oh gosh, well I just let them find their own kind mm -hmm. of route. Mm -hmm. um, but regarding a, a woman that, uh, uh, m the woman that would have been the most influence on me was my grandmother's mother, whose name was Kitty O'Grady. Mm -hmm. And she was also my godmother. Mm -hmm. And she was one of the ones when you stepped into her little house, like she had eight kids and they had two rooms, do you know what I mean, that kind of thing. When you stepped yes. into her little house, it was full of, you know, Padre Pio and the Virgin Mary and all that yes. kind of stuff. And yes. the, the Sacred Heart Lamp and all that stuff, you know. Yes. And um, But she was my godmother also. And in those days, your godmother was the person who who, um, who taught you spiritually speaking, took, abo took upon themselves your spiritual kind of progress, you know. This um, is communication that the godmother is the one In those days it was just unwritten law, that mm -hmm. it wasn't just that she's the person who'd get you if your parents croaked, do you know right. what I mean? Was, there was a whole lot more to it. Right, than there that. was an ongoing thing. Yeah. Right? yeah. And, uh, and I was mad about her and she was a lovely woman and she really understood my nature, you know. Yes. But uh, I used to say to her from the time I was little, well, how can you be my godmother if, my, if you're going to be dead before my parents, you know. Yes. And she'd say to me, well, you know, I'll be up with God and I'll be whispering in his ear to make sure, you know, you're all right and you don't get messed about, you know. So there was that kind of thing. Is, uh, because the day I was born on, there was a link with my grandmother. Was, I was born on the, um, the 8th of December, which is a Catholic feast day, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. So it's right. what we would call a Big Mary Day. Right. You know? right. um, and if you're a girl born on that day, every, all the women that you know associate you with the Virgin Mary. They give you pictures of Virgin Mary. and they, So all your life even, you, know, you, you get given all these things. So you start to build up this relationship with the idea of, of the mother of God or God the mother you might want to call it. Yes. So that pretty much came from my grandmother also, you know. Yes, um, yes. And do you and still feel her presence with you? Yeah, I think about her a lot actually, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm not sure whether you feel someone's presence or not, but you do in so, in so far as they're in your DNA. And yeah, yes. that, that's a person that, that would have probably had the most fundamental effect on my, uh, me as a woman. What mm -hmm. kind of woman did I want to be, you know? Mm -hmm. so. And I'm assuming you tell your children about her? Yeah, you know, the way my kids are that, that age, that they're not anything about me, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So I'll save it till they have kids, you know. So yeah, my older one knows all about her, and I have a picture of her up at home and everything, you know, so. Right. So it's interesting, because you're talking about your grandmother, your mother's mother, and you're talking about your children, and it reminds me of the, the picture of the matriarchs in the Bible, where yeah. they have so much to say, it's just nobody's asking them. Well, yeah. Well, it's funny, I was telling you about my little son, Yeshua, how he's a very silent person, but yes. my, that's what my granny was like. Like, you could spend a whole day in a room with her without uttering a word, would be communicating the whole time, you know, so it's not even so much sometimes that matriarchs have a lot to say, there's a power in what they're not saying. Yes. Their sure. silence and their kind of rootedness. Very you know, true. The understanding of listening and understanding the yeah, silences as yeah. well. I'd like to talk about your latest CD theology. And as soon as you open, I mean, I love the cover. The portrait of you is also on the inside of the jacket. I love that portrait because the eyes say on the cover, this is where I've been, and your smile says, but this is where I'm going. And then you have a sentence that spells itself out in the jacket. Mm. And it says, if God lived on earth, people would break his windows. God, for want of a better word, because it's a strange word, you know, um, is uh, uh, the most maligned and libeled, you know, person or energy or entity, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. you know, it's throughout history. Mm -hmm. um, and that everything gets blamed on God because we expect some perfection. Or you've got everybody blowing up the world claiming that they somehow represent God. Or you've got That's people right. telling people that, you know, you mustn't think good about yourself because God will not love you if you right. do or right. whatever. So everybody's bullshit. talking on behalf of God instead of to yeah, God. Yeah, and I mean that would be okay except for everybody's libeling God. I mean if God were here, he, she or it would be suing everyone for libel, you know. Okay. Um, and that's really what that sentence means and what it talks about. Um, mm. It, it also explained, like I say, my reason for making the record. Um, and where I got that phrase, if you asked me what, what were seminal moments in my life that would have governed my spirituality again around the age of seven, mm -hmm. eight, nine, mm -hmm. uh, Fiddler on the Roof, right? Really? That just completely blew my world 
apart that did like again having grown up as a Catholic which is great and everything mm -hmm. and we're taught the um, mainly the New Testament we're taught but they sometimes drift over into the Old Testament which I liked a bit better because it was just more colorful and it's more about God yes. where the New Testament is all about other people and it's all very interesting but we have it shoved down our throat as Catholics so sorry yes. so the Old Testament was much more interesting and intriguing to me yes. um, so I, I, I don't know what happened, but whenever I saw Fiddler on the Roof, it just completely, like I said, blew me apart. And um, I, I was madly in love with the guy that played the part and the whole, and even the character. The father, do you know the what father? I mean? The Tevye guy, you the know. Tevye guy. <laughs> and, um, but that, that just really just governed a lot. And it's actually from that, that quote is actually from that movie, yes. from that musical, The Old Matchmaker, when the, when the Russians come to scatter all the Jewish people, the, the standing in the street talking to someone, she goes, oh, I don't know what's happening. If God lived on earth, people would break his windows, yes. you know. Um, and I, th so I believe it's some old Jewish proverb or phrase or something, you know, but I don't yes. think it doesn't come from the Bible or anything. Yes, no, um, you're correct. But what I, I love that movie terribly, and I, I used to make my parents bring it to me any time it was ever on in a theatre, you know, and it totally got me into music too, because I'd listen to the orchestra tuning up and the whole, and the, the music in the thing was just outrageous, you know. But I liked the theology mostly because the Teddy conducts this relationship with God through singing and also through talking. Yes. He's always talking to him, he's always in that relationship yes, as he sees it. He's yeah. always chit-chatting. Yeah, and he even complains, which That's is right. great, because as Catholics we weren't allowed to complain. Oh. But I like the way he's always, you know. Right. But and at some point he even accuses. Exactly, uh, exactly, which yes. is great, you know, and he gets bitter with him, and uh, you know, which is brilliant, you yeah. know. It means we don't have to be perfect. But what I love really was he kept going on about the good book. He'd go, oh, the good book this and the good book that and all the good book this. And that made me want to go and read the good book. So, um, so that, and still now I'd watch it a thousand times. I must have seen it like a, a zillion times, you know. Yes, yes. So I love it. So anyway, that's where I got that from. But you movies. were talking about anger. And certainly in that yeah. movie, Tevi gets angry, and he takes yeah. that anger to God. Yeah. And, and turns yeah. with it to God. Well, he has a lot of issues in that movie, doesn't he? Because he has to examine his own rule, the rules and regulations and, and how right. they might stifle his daughters, or how they might even stifle himself. Do you know That's what I mean? right. So That's right. And how it's going to his relationships. Yeah. All of his relationships. But he, he, to me, he reminded me of the Jesus character also, because mm -hmm. the, the thing about Jesus, which I observed mostly, was that, again, Jesus is always conducting a, a vocal relationship with mm -hmm. God, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So the two characters have kind of similarities to me, really. But the the interest in working with music as a method of expression it would have come from people like Tevye. And then Bob Dylan had that record, Slow Train Coming, that came yes. out when I was about 11. Yes. Um, yes. And stuff like that. Then I began to hear like reggae or Rasta records and that kind of stuff. So. To me, the most important thing which has been lost, apart from, you know, obviously God's the most important thing which has been lost and, and is a ghost in its own home, you know, uh, the pink oh. elephant in the corner, you know. Yes. But the thing that's lost for us is joy. We should be taking mm. joy from life and from pr our spirituality, you know, and uh, an awful lot of people involved with religion, well, they just don't know how to be joyful. You know? I, I agree with you. I agree with you. It's one side that just gets neglected and absolutely needs to be brought to the yeah. forefront. Moving to the other side of the spectrum, you have a song, Watcher of Men, and yeah. it's uh, the words of Job that yeah. are present in that song. And I was yeah. fascinated when I first heard it because I'm thinking, that's Job, and that's a text without a female voice. Yeah. And I'm, I, I, ne I really do want well, to find out wife. from you. I think his, wife his wife is there, is there. very yeah. minimally. Thank you. I don't yeah, like what yeah, she's yeah. saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, but interesting she's, she's that that's the text. Are all idiots, which most wives do. Isn't yeah, it? actually, she, in that instance, she's right because even yeah. God is going to say no, they're wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting that you lend your voice, your woman's voice, to mm. a biblical text that is almost completely absent mm. of a female voice. So I'm wondering if you are challenging the text by saying, where is the woman's voice when you're talking about suffering? Or if you are saying to the text, I'm adding my voice so that there not be a gap. Well, for me, it's about that I would view the the uh, the Torah, or sorry, the Tanakh is the only book I use, right? Because I figure, as a Catholic, we ripped it all off from the Jews in the first place, so we may as well go to the horse's mouth. And I like the language better. It seems to me that you can understand the Tanakh on on, on a whole lot of different levels. Mm -hmm. You can take it literally, and you can take it symbolically, or whatever. You can take it almost as a as a story of a family, also, which then goes on as a story yes. of a quite a dysfunctional family. Yes. You know you can take it as, as a symbol. So I suppose I, I get delve into the symbolism of it. So to me, I don't see the Job as either male or female, as a human being. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, it's the human condition. Same thing all for all his stuff. friends? Um, yeah, that are also they represent to me the parts of my own psyche and personality. You know, we, mm -hmm. all, we all have different 
if you could put a face and arms and legs on the different parts of your own mind. You mm -hmm. know? So those to me also represent the different parts of my own mind. Isn't that interesting? You know? So you're reading the book of Job as actually everyone and every voice in it is the totality of one human being. Yeah, including God and the devil, if you like. You know? Including all of the... Including God and the devil, yes, you know. Yes, and yes. I mean, the whole Kabbalist... Who frame it at the beginning. Who yeah. the whole thing at the beginning. I used to study Kabbalah years and years ago and the, and the guy used to drum it into us that, you know, God made the devil. God created the yes. devil. You yes. know what I mean? Yes. Which is, and that's a, quite a frightening book from that point of view because you're wondering, well, why would God do this to Job? Like, just for a bet? Like yes, yes. And it's a hard lesson in that book, a really hard lesson. But Very hard. I suppose, again, like, again, I was attracted to it at times when I was going through terrible suffering myself. There was um, something I went through some years ago, and my father was the one who introduced me to the book of Job mm. as, as a method of actually coping, which, you know, somehow I couldn't explain why it helped, but it did help just to understand that this is a, the nature of being a human being. This is you know. the nature of being a human being, and part of what God explains to Job or tries to make him mm. see is that there's a balance in the universe and yeah. balance it means some people yeah. get while others don't and then well, it reverses. It's an even crueler lesson than that mm -hmm. um, the, the lesson is who the hell are you to even ask me mm. why I did this that or the other mm. because your, your you, you can't be see so much I you, you, you tell you, you should so be do you know mm -hmm. what I mean and that's a very hard thing for anyone to accept their lot as such do you know what I mean. Um, Has that message helped you? Is that a well, balanced you, message for you? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, it took me a while to understand. It was only when I did this song. It was a very interesting challenge to try to put the Book of Job into a three-minute song. Like, <laughs> you know. So yes. how, how do you make it simple for under, to someone to understand what happens in this book? Yes. So that meant you had to leave out a lot and just get the bare bones of the yes. story. So, you know, all this terrible stuff happens. This guy is suicidal. And to me, that was the thing that this book broaches in our times, is suicide. Yes. How people feel, you know, that's a massive issue in our times that we live in, you know, which is a spiritual uh, giving up that you were asking about, you know. Yes. But to me, this was a way of understanding the suicidal feeling or whatever. So if you'd want to explain to like a 10 year old what's in the book of Job, well, th all this dreadful stuff, God makes a bet for some unknown reason, a cruel bet with the devil to torment Job, right. you know, who then becomes completely suicidal and wants to reject his life right. and then thank God doesn't because of the assistance of people like his wife and, right. and his own somehow knowledge that he didn't do something to deserve this stuff. Right. And um, he doesn't want to give in. He wants an explanation. He doesn't want to give in but at the end what we have to understand it, it is a cruel and hard lesson but it's the best lesson you could learn is that you you don't have um, there's, there's a certain amount to which you have control but you don't have really the right to tell God that God should have done something different with you. That's because right. We didn't create the universe so we're not the ones and you're only a speck of dust all you are is dust and once you accept that then life is easy that's right. if you expect too much and you expect to be more than a piece of dust then you're going to feel unhappy and I know that you're a mother mm. and um, I'm a mother and we know that our bodies feed our children mm. from the moment that they're inside us and continue mm. afterwards and we don't um, we don't run out of being able to feed them as they need. Yeah. I'm wondering if you think a woman's spirituality is the same thing. Can it ever run out? Or is it as endless and as giving as our bodies are? Hmm. I guess if you say again that we're made in God's image and therefore somehow we're part of God and we're God's fingers, then yes. even if you perhaps are not a spiritual person, you actually are. Like, I always get atheists to pray for me because I figure that since everyone else is talking all the time, God must prick up his ear, do you know what I mean? So an atheist to me can sometimes be the most spiritual person that I've actually met. Right. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you so mean. I just think that by being alive, you are a spirit, and even when your body is not alive, you're still spirit, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So you can never run out of spirit. I think some people run out of hope mm -hmm. or belief, and I think the ultimate, obviously, symptom of that is suicide. Yes, you know. yes. So if a young woman were to come to you and say to you, and just following along those lines, mm -hmm. um, I have everything I would need, I have every reason to be happy, mm -hmm. um, I'm involved and productive in all of these ways, and I feel so incredibly spiritually empty, mm -hmm. what do you think would be the, the one piece of information you could give that, m that she might hear, that might lead her somewhere? I suppose, you know, what I, I have a son now who's 20 and he's at that big kind of crossroads in life, you know, and dealing with emotions and this, that or the other. And the best advice I ever got from, a, from an elderly kind of guide was that, you know, 
I am not my body, my mind or my feelings. I don't hang into every thought or every emotion that I have. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand that feelings are, and thoughts even are temporary things. You know, they're, they're not, just because you think a thing, just because you think a feel, uh, feel a thing doesn't mean you have to buy into it to the extent that you have convinced yourself that you're somehow spiritually bankrupt. Mm -hmm. it, it's all about what you think, you know. So I suppose I would advise you change your thinking you know because you're going to create what it is you're thinking but most importantly you know uh, not to do anything stupid people do stupid things because they feel spiritually bankrupt i.e class a drugs i.e you know sleep with some idiot or i.e top themselves you know right. um so i guess it's just to understand the temporary nature of uh, negative feelings mm -hmm. you know not to buy into them it's interesting that you're talking about time because and, and if I understand you correctly, really that's where you're saying the emphasis of that conversation would be that what, what, you're, what you're feeling right now and that emptiness you're feeling right now is right now. Well, that's part of your spirit. Yes. Like, do you know what I mean? That from nothing the world was created. Yes. Do you know what I mean? And my yes. father always complains, he sa or he says, you know, uh, chaos is good for creativity. He says the world was created out of chaos, but also he says the Swiss, you know, what all they did after the wars was make cuckoo clocks. <laughs> you know, which is true, you know, so like a vast emptiness can be, you know, a blessing, that's a painful place to be, but yes. it's like, and they say all the, all the theologies of all religion, there's this going into the desert yes. phase, you know. It's almost to remove yourself from all of what's going on and just to yeah. be able to reconnect, but at the same time allow yourself to transform, allow yourself to... Or just to find, you. we all find ourselves at points uh, in a, in a a barren place, a frighteningly large place with no boundaries, do you know, yes. that we don't understand, a bereft place. You yes, know? yes, yes. But we get conditioned to think that that's a bad thing, yes. just as we get conditioned to think death is a bad thing. Right. You know, right. Um, so it's a question of n learning to separate yourself and that which is the spiritual wilderness of what people told you to be and what you she right. felt as so a gap. So in other words, redefine your reference points. Listen yeah, to yourself well, and redefine your reference points. Yeah, and just uh, don't do anything stupid. And just don't do anything hold on stupid. and don't do anything Absolutely stupid. Absolutely right. Hold yeah. on, hold on, because the thinking can change in an instant. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sinead. It's really been a privilege to, to share these thoughts with you.